everybody, this is Chris with The Ancient Scholar. I hope this video finds you all doing well. Today is Saturday, 17 April 2021. As you can see, I am heading up into the mountains, trying to get some uh, mountain biking in today, and uh, to escape from the predictably heavy winds that plague us down in the desert uh, this time of the year as uh, things heat up. There are also lots of uh, low pressure weather systems around us, primarily to the north, but northern New Mexico and Colorado is driving rather poor weather. Uh, I get up into the hills, into some trees, uh, hopefully the wind will be a little better attenuated. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine today. As many of you are probably aware, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been put on hold the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, the United States has uh, recommended a temporary hold to do uh, some additional investigating regarding the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So let's just talk about what's going on with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So what's going on is about uh, 6.8 million people, so 6,800,000 people, a little over that, have received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And of those, there have been about half a dozen reports of a, a rare but substantial condition. And uh, this condition involves two problems. Uh, the first problem is a rare issue that's referred to as uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST. Let's talk about what that is. So cerebral means brain, venous refers to vein, sinus refers to a venous sinus, I'll talk about what those are, and thrombosis refers to a clot. So it's a clot, essentially it's a clot that forms in a, uh, uh, a venous sinus uh, within the brain. So let's talk about the circulation, and how blood goes in and out of the brain. So arterial blood, oxygenated blood goes into the brain by primarily by a set of two major arteries. There are two arteries up in the front, the, uh, the internal carotid. The carotid actually bifurcates into two major branches or two major vessels, the external carotid. And the external carotid goes to the face, the scalp, everything outside of the skull. And then the internal carotids on the right and left uh, penetrate into the front of the brain and they supply the front part of the brain uh, with blood. And then you have a set of arteries that actually go up, come off of the uh, subclavian uh, arteries underneath your clavicle and go up through your cervical spine. They're little forama, little holes in, um, on the, the lateral aspect of the side of your cervical vertebrae and those little arteries go up through those holes into the back of the brain and perfuse the back of the brain, the, uh, the, the occipital area, the you know, cerebellum, and so on. And so arterial blood goes in through those arteries, goes through the brain, and delivers oxygen and nutrients to the neurons. And then, like any other organ, then that blood needs to be drained out of the organ into the venous system and go back to the heart, get pumped into lungs, get reoxygenated, and pumped back out to the body. And, and the way that happens is the uh, our, our arteries branch out or bifurcate into what are called arterioles, smaller arteries, and then the arterioles branch out into these tiny little microscopic networks called capillaries. And that's uh, capillaries are really tiny. And like individual little red blood cells can pass through those capillaries, deliver their oxygen um, and nutrients to the, uh, the individual tissues, the tissue beds and the cells. And then those capillaries go into tiny little structures called venules. And then the venules become veins. And then what happens in many organs, the brain included, the, the veins have a very different kind of structure than the arteries. Because the arterial system is dealing with higher pressures, the arteries have lots of smooth muscle in them that can contract. And so you get uh, a, a kind of a, a thicker, tougher vessel 
um, that can can squeeze down and open up uh, quite quite uh, markedly in some cases. Uh, that can happen to a minor extent in, in veins, but because you're dealing with much lower pressures in the venous system, uh, the veins are kind of floppy, they're lower pressures, and veins actually have valves in them to prevent backflow of blood because the pressure uh, can be so low, and this is uh, particularly pronounced in uh, more dependent areas of your body, like your legs, and more distal areas of your body, like your arms, for example. And so what can happen is those veins can connect into these these large open areas. Essentially, it's kind of like an open area where several veins come into, um, and you just kind of have pooling or collection of venous blood in that large open area. It's called a sinus, and you have several sinuses in your brain. You've got this, this sinus basically right on top here, central sinus and lateral sinuses and so on. So blood can collect in those sinuses, and then that blood ultimately drains out of the brain through the uh, uh, through uh, large veins and eventually go into the uh, vena cava or the vena cava, uh, the superior vena cava in, in, in the case of the brain, and then that goes back to the right side of the heart and gets pumped to the lungs, reoxygenated, and the left side of the heart out of the body. Okay, so that's basically how blood circulates through the brain. So what's happening in these six cases is these patients are developing blood clots in those sinuses. And what can happen there is if you develop a blood clot, then you kind of get a, you kind of get back pressure developed, right? You kind of, that venous drainage backs up into the brain. And these patients can develop uh, severe headaches. They can have altered mental status. Their vision can change. They may have seizures. They may even have stroke-like signs and symptoms following their face, their arms, their legs. Um, and it, it can be life-threatening. Um, uh, so in the United States, of the six cases uh, that we see, I believe one of them has died, and one is in pretty, pretty rough shape from what I understand. And uh, interestingly enough, that demographically, uh, of, I believe, all of the six cases are women uh, between the ages, of, so fair, uh, younger women, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to mid to late 40s, 18 to 48. Um, so women in their childbearing years, uh, adolescent to uh, pre- or perimenopausal women, and that may or may not be uh, substantial. We do know that um, there is a background rate of this. Uh, and it, the background rate kind of varies a little bit, um, but on the average, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of, of just background without vaccines or anything. Just when we look at the population over a year, we see this condition is approximately one in a hundred thousand people and it's going to be more likely in certain people uh, for example people that take oral contraceptives are going to be a higher risk because oral contraception tends to make you more hypercoagulable hypercoag means clot hyper means higher more likely uh, pregnant people who are pregnant are more likely to develop this uh, and so at this point it's not clear it's not entirely clear if this cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is not clear if this is if we're just seeing the background rate of it or if we're seeing some sort of signal that is specific to the Johnson Johnson vaccine, right? Because, um, you know, 6.8 plus million people and about half a dozen people have gotten it. So that's a little less than a one in a million um, chance. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's lower than the background rate, and it's certainly lower, like, when we look at people that get COVID, um, it's like something like 20, 25 per 100,000 or something, something like that uh, of, of people that get COVID will develop this, right? So there, there's definitely an argument that vaccination is probably 
protective against cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. But be that as it may, I, I believe the FDA is, is just being extraordinarily cautious here um, in, in taking a pause and gathering more data, getting more evidence. Um, but that's not the only thing that's going on in these cases. The other thing that we're seeing in these cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, these half dozen that we've detected, um, and this is actually, as I understand, has been detected through the VAERS system, and the VAERS system is in the United States is essentially um, a reporting system where if you suspect that there has been a potential side effect to a vaccination, you can put that information into this online database it's called the VAERS. Um, and I believe that's how they've detected this potential signal. Um, and it is, these, all of these cases are in women 18 to 48 years of age who are within one to two weeks of having the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So there is um, correlation, right? There, there's some strong correlation uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's causation. That's what we're trying to figure out. That's what this pause is about, is, is an attempt to establish a causal relationship if possible. Okay. The other thing that we're seeing in these cases is something called thrombocytopenia. And thrombocytopenia means a low platelet. So thrombocytes are platelets. These are cell fragments that aggregate or clump together to initiate um, a temporary clot to help control bleeding. Um, but in these, in, in these cases, we're actually seeing a loss of these thrombocytes. Um, so we're seeing clots form with loss of thrombocytes. Um, and this is, this is somewhat similar to a, another related problem, something called HIT, that's heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. In, in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, is a, it's a relatively rare situation but we see it in people who receive heparin and, and heparin products. Uh, and heparin, of course, is a very common anticoagulant heparin-related, like uh, uh, Lovenox, which is low molecular weight heparin, and oxaparin. Um, and we see this in a, a small percentage of all patients who receive heparin. And essentially what happens is um, heparin combines with um, or can combine with other proteins in the body, and that heparin protein combination uh, elicits an immune response, and the body creates antibodies, and these antibodies uh, attach to. Sorry about the pause there. Someone tried to call me, and the the, the iPhone can't it, it stop recording. That's unfortunate. So let me continue. So uh, the body produces antibodies against this, this heparin uh, protein complex, and those antibodies uh, are, um, this complex is, uh, is, is it's, its shape is very close to the shape of, of um, components of platelets. And so those antibodies then attack the platelets. They attach to the platelets, and they cause the platelets to basically fall out of suspension in your blood, and they aggregate, right? So they fall out of suspension. They can't stay dissolved in the blood, so to speak, and they fall out, and they're not able to work. And then that initiate that can initiate clotting. Um, so you can actually get clotting in the presence of low platelets, when HIT occurs, even though you're giving heparin to try to prevent clotting. So it's this enig enigmatic uh, phenomenon that can occur. And this is remarkably similar to what we have seen in these half a dozen cases. And so because we're seeing this, this suggests that there is a mechanism like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia occurring in these patients, and because these patients are receiving a, uh, a 
vaccine within a, a week or two of them developing this, right? That is a very curious connection, um, and I think it is. Uh, I think it is, further investigation is absolutely warranted. Um, I'm not entirely sure if a causal relationship will be established. Um, it very well may be, but I, I do think that it is uh, sound to investigate this further, even though the, the overall rate of this occurring is very, very low, uh, lower than the, apparently lower than the background rate, um, but I think it's still concerning, and uh, we could have more cases as well, so uh, I, I think it's a good thing to investigate this. And my suspicion is that they will probably continue with the uh, vaccine, with the, the Johnson Johnson vaccine. That, that's what I suspect is that the the pause will uh, the pause will stop within some number of days to weeks, and perhaps what what will occur is uh, there will be modifications that uh, certain patients or patient populations may not uh, receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. For example, uh, female women, biological women of uh, childbearing age, uh, or uh, women, biological women that are taking uh, hormonal-based oral contraception or hormonal-based uh, contraceptives in general, uh, because they are probably going to be at higher risk for this occurring. So that would be my guess, is that there will be some modifications that will occur. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, I'm, again, this is, this is fairly new. This is a fairly recent... Okay, we'll just cut it off here. The uh, camera keeps failing. Uh, I have multiple people attempting to call me. Uh, so uh, I think I've conveyed what I needed to in this particular video. Uh, so we're fairly early on into this, but I still felt it was necessary to uh, discuss this this issue. I think it's an important issue, and hopefully I have illuminated the things a little better, and hopefully people understand what's actually going on a little better. The This dual problem of a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and uh, thrombocytopenia. Okay, everyone, I'm going to let you go. Hopefully enjoyed this video and hopefully you found it helpful. As always, uh, thanks for hanging in there. Stay safe doing whatever you may be doing.